everybody and welcome to our week one Animal Behaviour and Welfare MOOC hangout for the second iteration of the MOOC. So week one, run two of the MOOC. I'm Jill and... And I'm Nat. <laughs> and some of you may have seen me already on the live, uh, well, on the videos that um, have been being put up and played this, this week. It's a little bit disconcerting because this happened the last time. <laughs> but our mouth and our words are just not in sync. So we have to unfortunately watch ourselves um, on the screen whilst we're talking to you. And that's not something that is a particularly easy thing to do. Yeah, it's a bit disconcerting. So yeah, we apologize for that if we are acting a little bit odd. We also have some notes, but we've left them on our other computer screen, which you can't here. see. And if we sort of look over that way, it's because we're trying to remind ourselves of a question that we wanted to answer from the forums. So uh, we don't have any viewers live just yet. I'm hoping that they'll start joining us. We're actually running two minutes ahead of schedule. I know, we're just ahead of ourselves. I'm just so prompt. So we should just talk about ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> we're just, you know. Yeah, well, I think, actually, I just want to say, first off, that I'm really pleased with how the forums are going and the way that everybody's behaving in the in the forums. Um, we had a couple of uh, mentions about our Reels of Engagement video that myself and Nat did. <laughs> our uh, wonderful our, acting. Yeah, our, our Oscar-winning <laughs> acting, I think. And uh, a couple of people said they thought that was quite useful. So if you did find that useful, I'm glad. Uh, we'll maybe try and do a, a more better oh, yeah, quality yeah. version of it. A sleeker it's version. A sleeker version, maybe, when we run the course for a third time. Mm. Um, but yeah, it was something we wanted to try because we do know that animal welfare is a very emotive issue. And we really like the idea that um, you guys could, could learn from the way that we discuss it. So I see that we've got some viewers now. You'll see that there's a question and answers app. So the format of these mix, uh, these mix, oh my goodness, uh, these hangouts is that we, uh, myself and Nat, we start off with questions which were raised on the forums, and then we move on to questions that have been asked in the hangout uh, live. So you can type some questions as you go. Okay, so we'll kick off by um, um, perhaps answering some of the questions that have come up. Um, within the, the MOOC and the discussion forums and um, and we'll try and answer them. You by all means can comment um, by sending in little comments and if you agree with us or you've got something you'd like to say then you can do so and we'll try and pick them up so that's why there's two of us so that we yeah. can chat amongst ourselves and we can support each other um, by you know checking out the, the questions as they come through. Yes. Okay so that one of the first ones I'm, I'm now looking at the other screen um, was um, raised by Hannan Yinnan. So if Hannan's there, thank you very much. And this one was actually quite interesting and it's quite a, it's a, quite an in-depth question, but basically um, he or she... Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know if you're a uh, male or a female, Hannan. Um, <laughs> was asking that, about um, pet ownership generally and, and some interesting questions about why we own pets and what we get out of owning pets and what pets get out of being owned if they get anything um, and also some questions about stroking pets um, or petting um, as in you know making why is it that humans seem to enjoy um, the kind of furry coats especially when we don't have furry coats yeah. um, so we thought we'd start with that and we'd probably extend it a little bit into what we've actually um, done whilst we've domesticated pets um, to get them to sort of fit better our own needs. Mm. It's one of uh, one of my favourite topics as I mentioned on the forums and I think um, probably the best thing to start off with is some of the human effects of owning a pet. So there's loads of literature and scientific research out there which has found that people are much more relaxed around their own companion animals and this is particularly true of dogs and cats, the small fluffy ones that, um, that are very good at sharing their lives with us. Uh, there's a really interesting study, um, and I've momentarily forgotten the author, but I'll go and look it up and I'll post it in the forums later, where uh, a group of scientists wanted to apply what we think of as a psychological stressor. And this one was a very common psychological stressor that they gave them a mental arithmetic task to do. So they had this uh, cohort of women and they gave these women a mental arithmetic task to do, and they did it in two different environments. They did it in a, 
a lab environment where it was uh, very novel and the experimenters wore white coats, which is known to also increase people's blood pressure. And they also made them do the mental arithmetic test in front of one of their friends. And they sort of recorded heart rate in these environments and, and, uh, and watched how people's heart rates responded to this. But then they also made them do the same kind of test in the home environment in front of a friend and in front of their companion animal. And when you're in the home with the companion animal, the resting heart rate was no different from uh, during the mental arithmetic stressor as it was while resting. So pets are really, really good at alleviating these kind of stresses. And I think mm. certainly if I've had a bad day at the office and I'm really frazzled about something, I go home and sort of rant to my cat for a little while. <laughs> yeah, actually, I mean, there, there's um, organisations now, some of you may already be members of them, and those organisations, scientific organisations that are set up to really and bring together people who are interested in the human animal bond and and the way in which humans and animals interact and and the positive benefits um, to humans and also the effects on animals so that, and mm. we can post up some of those societies so that you can look at least at some of the proceedings of their yeah. conferences which i think might, you know, might be quite interesting but there's another area that's of particular interest and that's what we have done to pets to, to make them better fit our needs, not just behaviour, because we'll talk about that in a minute, but also what they look like. Yeah, so there's another um, couple of very interesting studies, particularly around dogs. We have selected for dogs which look more juvenile, and the word for this is neotenous, which is the retention of juvenile features. And we've selected for dogs which are closer and closer to the, the puppy form of a wolf uh, because we find these, future, uh, these features very appealing. And what's really interesting is there's a, a small study and it was done on university students. So it's one of these things where whenever you're doing human behavior, you have to look at what your sample was and can you generalize from that. But there is an interesting little study where they took a um, photograph of a baby, a human baby, and they actually edited its features to be more neotenous, so wider eyes, uh, rosier lips and, and bigger cheeks and uh, they made another photo look slightly older so they slimmed down mm. those features and they asked the humans which one did they prefer and humans always go for the more neotenous baby mm. because we have this uh, James Serpel calls it a cute response. We just like these little cute things. Yeah, it's a yeah. biological round thing in faces and, yeah. and round big eyes. And it kind of makes you go little little noses. Yes. Yes. And that's it's it's a, a biological driver. It's really interesting. And we have selected our pets, particularly our dogs, to do this as well. What's really really interesting about this is there's a great paper. I think it's by goldsmith i'll look it up but they looked at uh, several breeds of dogs and they placed them on a scale of their neotenous features so for example a, a siberian husky is not very neotenous versus the king charles spaniel which is very neotenous in comparison it's got much wider eyes much sort of rounder lips and uh, and there's been much more selective breeding to get to the uh, the, the spaniel but they also had dog breeds such as the german shepherd which have actually been bred back to look more like wolves from the original uh, breed of dog. And they looked at what kind of submissive behaviours each dog breed could show. And the further we breed for these neotenous features, the dogs begin to lose more submissive behaviours within their own social groups. And whether it's uh, because they physiologically cannot show those behaviours anymore, um, particularly if we have bred for an animal like the spaniels, which have these sort of dro droopy ears, then they then can't use their ear position signal. Mm. to signal to other dogs. And that's a very interesting sort mm. of conundrum that we put them in. They may be sort of, uh, there might be a, a part of them that wants to communicate that but can't, or it might be that they actually just don't have uh, any need to communicate. They just don't know how to communicate. It never crosses their mind. One of the sort of, you don't know what you've never missed. Um, but there's a really interesting paper. I'll try and remember to link it on the forum. Somebody please remind me if I if I don't. Uh, but it looked at the sort of the impact on behaviour that our selective breeding has mm. done. So we selectively bred for phenotype. You know, we looked. We were mm. interested in what they looked like, and actually, it's had a knock-on effect to behaviour and and so on. And in fact, you see that quite often. A lot of the juvenile behavior traits that you see in adult dogs like playing i mean most 
you know, playing is something that is really just enjoyed by um, the kind of, you yeah. know, the young. And there's good reasons why animals play. And that's to do with them learning sort of to develop their motor skills, learning social rules, and, um, you know, kind of learning to hunt if it's a cat, for example. Um, so kittens play, spend a lot of time playing and tossing things around and, and sort of fake um, jumping on things. And all of that is, has good functional value. Um, but then as they reach sort of more mature, you know, maturity, then there's a whole heap of other things that have to spend their time doing and play um, happens less and less. But what we do find obviously is with our pets, that kind of playing that you, you know, that you still see in adult cats and adult dogs um, is, is maintained. And that's because we've bred them like that. Yeah. So there's quite a lot of interesting things that we have done to get our pets to fit the sort of needs that we as humans have of them. So I guess the question really is then, and it kind of brings us to some of the other questions. Oops, my computer's decided to move. It brings us to some of these other questions that have come up on the forum. And that's really to do with, you know, um, whether that all affects their welfare, particularly when we're talking about freedom to express natural behavior. And that was raised, hang on, I'm gonna roll down. Um, and that was raised by um, Jill Daly, good name, um, who who basically says, you know, in in that situation, um, she has problems really thinking about whether we can allow animals to, whether we do allow animals to express their natural behaviour, because we've we've either bred their natural behaviour out or we suppress their natural behaviour because it doesn't fit um, the kind of lifestyle that we want to have with them. In a domestic situation, and um, and some of you may have seen um, there was some nice discussion that started about whether we should have bits in horses' mouths, and it was prompted because of the video where you can see me holding my horse with a bridle on and a bit in its mouth, and um, you know, and I think you know that really is sort of one of the things that we do with horses um, because people want to ride them, which is why we've domesticated them, why many people keep horses. The same goes for dogs, you know, where we have um, dogs that no longer, you know, are, are encouraged to bark. Um, and some people take it to the extreme. And in some countries, they have their dogs debarked, or where we've got cats and they people don't want them to claw their furniture. And so um, they either have little clawing, declawing mitts, or, you know, to keep their mitts, yes. uh, to keep their claws away from the furniture, or the, the extreme where sur surgery takes place to get rid of their claws. So, you know, we do some pretty bad things to animals in order to keep them as pets and yet we would hope that because they're pets they're treated better so it's a difficult one it is and i think it um it really sort of comes down to uh again an ethical issue if it is your uh sort of want and desire to keep pets you have to for some extent limit some kind of uh some of their behaviors so for example i have a cat and i limit her ability to roam she's an indoor cat and in the uk that's not very common uh, i do it because i believe that she's safer indoors because of where i live and uh, but that was a choice i made and i choose to limit her behavior in order to uh yeah, so you, you have a but pet. you live in in a very busy city i do and yeah i think that's not unusual for people who keep cats in cities no and not there's at all. the question of whether or not that's appropriate to keep cats where there's a lot of other mm. cats and it's very built up um and obviously there's the traffic situation um so i know that there's always been this quite interesting debate about welfare um particularly for cats yeah um because you know do they if if they're put outside and they're encouraged to go outside um, and they're in an urban situation, they're more likely to come across lots of other cats and that can be very stressful for them. And plus, of course, there's the danger of them being chased by dogs and, yeah. or run over traffic accidents. And so there's this kind of balance. If you choose to have a pet, your responsibility is to keep that pet safe. But in doing so, you are restricting their behavior. Um, but how much of their behavior could be natural anyway in an urban environment is questionable. Mm. Now, I'd like to point out um, that we've just accepted a question from someone called Mel Megan Griffiths. Megan, you've asked, um, I can't find the forum. I'm assuming you mean 
hangout, but then you have found us because you're on the hangout by asking the question. Yes, this is the hangout. Um, but if you want to see the discussion forums, then you just have to click on discussion forums when you get into your MOOC page. Yes, and I will point out if you are using the Coursera mobile app, um, I wonder if I can show you it. It's relatively new this time around. And uh, I noticed the other day that there's not actually a direct link to the forum. So I don't know if you can see this, but this is the uh, yeah, sort of back to front. You can't really see that. But this is the Coursera app. And it's a little bit more difficult to see uh, where the forums are on the Coursera app. If you go to the week one introduction, you'll get a link to the forums in the text in there. OK? Can I want you to find it. Hey! Well done, Megan. Um, so yes, going back to the pet situation, um, I think it is a complicated, it's very complicated because I think, you know, it, it, I've seen that there's been fantastic discussion about whether we should eat meat, whether we should, you know, use animals for, for anything at all, um, you know, and, and there's lots of different views and they're very, very, you know, very strongly held views and they're obviously very much based around our own ethics about animals. Yeah. Um, it's always very interesting to me that um, most people really want to have, you know, especially animal people, they want to have pets in their household. They want to have, uh, you know, animals that, that they can spend time with. But we were just discussing this, that where with dogs, most of the time dogs will seek humans out. They will, you know, whether they're feral dogs or whether they mm. are dogs in the home they they seem to they're sociable they've always been sociable and that's probably why we've been able to enjoy their company for so long but there are other animals that we live with that are less sociable and cats were always seen to be you know animals that were less sociable and not so accepting of having other animals in the household especially other cats but increasingly we're seeing more and more cats I mean I think in the UK cats are actually uh, they outnumber yes, dogs now do. as pets and you know cats are you know very different from each other individually but they do accept that they you know that they can accept other animals in the household and many of us I'm sure have got not quite a number of cats and as long as they've got plenty of resources they seem to be able to to live quite comfortably alongside each other and we were just talking about our own cats and the fact that our cats appear to seek us out. Um, they seek us for, you know, to be stroked. They seem to enjoy our company. They come for walks with us of their own choice, it seems. And so, you know, th there seems to be a kind of mutual benefit to having, uh, you know, having that relationship. Then let's move to some of the other pets then. What about mice? Mm. Or, you know, my son has a bearded dragon or fish. I mean, you know, are they really pets? And I think this is a question that was brought up on the forums. You know, what is a pet? And, you know, how far does it extend? Is the definition that the animal seeks us out as much as we seek it out? Um, and how much can we provide for their welfare um, in, a, in a domestic situation where, in fact, we are going to be restricting quite a lot of their yes, natural behaviour? And I think there's also a point to be made um, particularly about a uh, too literal interpretation of the five freedoms. So, you know, the freedom for normal and natural behaviours would also include aggression and males fighting one another for females in many, many species, that sort of thing. And we want to avoid that because that would then compromise the freedom from injury, pain and disease. Uh, similar to the, um, the question about uh, the obese cat, you know, she had, I say in the video that she's had a little bit too much freedom from hunger and thirst. Uh, don't interpret the five freedoms in a very, very literal sense, uh, but remember that they all have to come together. And if you think about other welfare frameworks and concepts such as duty of care, providing a good welfare uh, arrangement and environment for your animals, and quality of life, does the animal have a life worth living? Um, are other ways that you can think about the the provisions that you make for the animals that you that you take care of. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, there's been a point met, uh, raised um, on our little strip of questions and things at the side there that was um, saying that you know there are other reasons for from the point of view of the welfare of other species um, why we might keep oh, cats yes. inside. And I and mean, this is a big issue. I, I used to live in New Zealand, and I know that we've got some. Um, probably some Kiwi viewers, but we've also got some Australian 
viewers and there you know there is quite a big issue about wild birds and um and concern mm -hmm. about the impact that cats have on birds and, and other small animals so that yeah there's there's other reasons now a nice question that was also raised or a point that's been raised here by arcadio yeah yeah I think so. um is uh, on the same topic what about sterilization of pets well this is quite an interesting one and um there's a lot of discussion about this you know who to whose benefit um you know, we have quite a lot of research projects looking at population management control and the welfare of animals um, in developing countries and there are issues with this in that you know on one hand having too many dogs um, on the streets where they become a public health issue and therefore people fear them and therefore the knock-on effect is that they treat those animals perhaps less well than they should and those dogs you know might get chased away and maybe even abused people fear them especially when there's an outbreak of something like rabies mm. um you know the welfare of those individuals is not good on the other hand for the short life that they have and they do have a shorter life when they live on the streets they do have a, a lot of freedom um they can mate with each other they can walk around they can go where they like they can sleep where they like they can socialize with whom they like and for for animals that are in good physical condition um, which isn't always the case, you know, they probably have a degree of freedom that they don't have in a, in a home situation. And so, you know, when you start asking about, well, should we impose sterilization on them, um, you know, where we're trying to control the population because of the problems for humans, um, then, you know, all we can say is that having fewer animals that are healthy in that they're able to live alongside a community without having the fear and, and the problems that, that, are, that are caused by fear um, from those humans um, will probably mean that they have better welfare, probably. Yeah. But there's not really that much research that's really been done on this. The second issue is that the population management measures themselves, the trap, neuter, release programs are normally set up to try to reduce the numbers of dogs in an area and so dogs are picked up from a particular area they'll be taken away then um, they, they're castrated and then they might be brought back and then they're brought back and, and they're released into the same place that they were picked up from which sounds fine except for of course for that animal it's an incredibly stressful situation they are removed um, often forcibly they are transported to some very well-meaning people who will um, you know put them into cages observe them and then operate on them and then check that they've come around okay maybe inject them and then put them back out onto the streets it means that they have to be transported and then they have to re kind of connect with their social group all of it's very very stressful and no one's really looked at the stress that's associated mm. with that you know the welfare implications of trying to do a good thing on an individual dog and those are the sorts of projects that are now starting to go on in fact that's a project that we have going here and that's um hopefully going to allow us to understand a lot, a lot better if we are going to do those sorts of programs the kind of measures that need to be made to ensure the welfare of those individual dogs so that's dogs where you've got lots of problems with population management from a human point of view and then you've got the kind of you know sterilization that goes on because we want to have dogs that are manageable in the home and we don't want to have you know lots of unwanted puppies mm. and we don't want to have unwanted sexual behavior which causes dogs to be you know for example um you know you might start a male that a young male that starts roaming and maybe gets itself on the streets and um, causes an accident and gets itself hurt and so on so you know we we do that again to benefit ourselves but also to benefit some aspects of that animal's well-being um but for that male dog um it may well be more preferable for it to keep itself entire and enjoy all that that brings or is it that uh the only sort of we don't know exactly what a dog prefers i mean it's I, i'm not even sure how you would begin to investigate whether or not a dog prefers to be neutered or unneutered. Um, mm. we, we'll talk next week about things like motivation tests and the way that we can ask animals about their uh, their welfare situation and uh, measuring 
animal welfare in a much more scientific and structured fashion mm. but I don't even know how you would sort of go about trying to no, measure that. No. And most of the research that has been done that's associated with um, you know castrating animals has been done looking at farm animals. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of livestock research and that hasn't really been to do with the loss of things that those animals were able to perform or were motivated to perform um, prior to castration. That's always been about the actual procedure itself. And now there's been some very good research that's shown very clearly um, how important it is to manage the pain associated with those procedures and how um, this slips very neatly into a question that was asked about speciesism actually. Um, you know, how in, in livestock animals, you know, there has tended to be less analgesics, less painkillers used, pain management used for similar procedures or the same procedure that has been carried out on a dog, a male dog. But actually within, within, if we look a little bit further, there's been some nice research that's also shown that there's differences in the way in which dogs and cats are treated. So where you've got dogs and cats going to be sterilized, castrated, neutered, whatever you want to call it, you also find that cats get less pain management than dogs. And that's perhaps because they respond differently. So dogs, you know, people feel closer to and they and they um, perhaps um, dogs will show more pain behaviors perhaps because they're more comfortable around people whereas a cat's normal response to stress or pain is to hide mm. or just to reduce its behavior completely just crouch very quietly um, because it is a prey animal and so it's sort of because its response is less overt it perhaps then ends up with less um, pain management being given to it and there's other reasons as well but that's the main reason and um, so it's an interesting you know situation where you can take the same procedure on an animal that has a very similar sorts of physiology in terms of pain and you end up having different ways that that is managed depending on the kind of animal it is whether it's yeah. out in the you know out in the streets of India or whether it's in a, a home in Edinburgh and whether it's a cat or a dog or whether it's a companion animal or a livestock animal. Yeah, and I possibly shouldn't say this, but we do have a super secret project about uh, some dogs in India, which uh, if you follow us on Twitter, which is at J-M-I-C-A-W-E or at Jimmy Call, um, uh, and follow our YouTube channel, you will be one of the first to hear about that, but it's super secret. I can't share too much about it, but we're quite mm -hmm. excited. Mm -hmm. But there will be, be really a video good. that will yeah. show you quite a bit about what goes on. And um, we're hoping if our lovely filmmaker, Tim, manages to um, get on get on to this, that um, it'll be released in the next couple of weeks so that yeah. you'll all be able to watch it. So keep that in mind. Mm. Okay. Right, what else have we got here? Well, we have an interesting question here, um, which I, th I think we could probably answer in more general terms about ethics. Or we've got some questions still on the forums. I don't know what do we want to answer next. All right. Okay. Um, let's let's stick with them. Um, Let's have a look at some ethics questions because actually yeah. there's been quite a lot of there ethics has been discussion. A, there has been a lot. There? So this is a question from uh, Shigufta and Shigufta is saying, so an animal uh, rights organization urged people to boycott wool this winter in order to protest against animal cruelty in the wool industry. And Shigufta feels that this is not necessarily a solution to stop animal uh, to stop sheep cruelty in particular. And what do we think? And this links back to a question that um, somebody asked, and I'm sorry, I forgot your name on the forums, but uh, somebody asked me whether our ethics and animal rights has any place in deciding what we as a society do about animals. Mm -hmm. And my answer to that is yes, absolutely. So. As scientists, our role is to investigate animal welfare. And remember, animal welfare is concerned with the subjective um, experience of the animal. So we're <coughs> interested at looking at what does the animal perceive? How does the animal uh, react to that? If the animal had a choice, what would the animal uh, actually prefer? And as I said, you'll find out more about the sort of methodology behind that next week. Um, and then we can provide this information. We can interpret this information for society. But 
As scientists, we can't then say whether or not an action is right or wrong. That is what your personal ethics and your own moral, uh, your own moral compass really says. And but, you know, that doesn't always, so I'm going to jump in here because it's an interesting one, that doesn't always sit very comfortably with a lot of people. They expect more from their scientists. Yes. And that is a problem for many scientists because the, the rigour of science is such that um, you really have to, the way that science works is that you really have to um, almost set aside where well, you have to set aside your ethics and your opinion to try to get to an in pursuit of the truth and to try to get further and closer to what reality is the the problem is that that isn't always you know it's not always absolute and science develops all the time and so the bit of information that you gain from one scientific study will then lead you to doing something else that might provide you with more information so it's it's an ongoing, evolving process, yeah. you know. And, and so when people look to scientists, they go, "Well, tell us, tell us the truth, <laughs> tell us what it is." And the reality is that they can't. And if you read most scientific papers, they will say, "This may be," or you know, "This is significant," um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's absolutely yeah. the truth. And somebody else might come along with a bit more information, you know, next year, which will make you revise that. Um, you know, that particular finding. And I'd just like to pick up on something you said, Nat, where you said that as scientists we can put our ethics aside. And what we mean by that is our personal ethics. I have done uh, many experiments where, not necessarily experiments, but even just uh, research projects where I have observed animals. And sometimes it has distressed me, but I have never acted against my own uh, ethics and I've never acted against an ethics committee any animal research that happens in the UK and most human research as well must go through the ethics committee of um, either of the university or the research institute or even um, through the home office license if you're going to do any work um, relate which may cause pain or suffering to protected animals and this in fact can this home office licensing home office licensing in the UK goes even further than just within the experiment. It also protects the data and anything utilized by that data. So for example, I wanted to do a little bit of teaching based on a home office experiment and it was a, a very mild experiment, but because it was, uh, the, you know, th there was a home office license on the experiment, the animals were not harmed in any way. Uh, they didn't suffer. It was simply, a, it was actually a motivation choice experiment. I still had to go then and seek the home office licensor's permission to use information from that experiment in a teaching resource that I'm developing for schools. So that's how seriously as scientists we do take the ethics and the ethics committees that we're in. But what we can't do is... We can't judge the outcome before yes, it happens. Yes. So what I've noticed actually with some of the discussion that's gone on is that people disagree with something because they don't like it. And I think that's absolutely fine. But th but then to say that that is actually what is going on for that animal is, is where I think that falls down. So I might disagree with things, and there are lots of things I disagree with just because I don't like them, you know, because I think that they're not necessary or I don't like them or it's not, it's not my thing. Um, but I can also appreciate that if I really wanted to demonstrate that there was a problem for an animal, not just for me, that I would have to actually go and study it. Now, that's often something that doesn't sit well with people because people will say, well, why do you need to study it? Why do you need to go and actually, you know, do something that seems common sense? Mm. Um, and, our, and our point really is that sometimes what looks like common sense isn't actually the way it is for another species. Yeah. Um, it, you know, th that it's, that it's different and it's important that we do know those differences if we're going to make big judgments yeah. um, that are going to change the way that we do things and and hopefully improve the welfare of those animals i think not I think you know trying to not make assumptions and run a study so that it's um you know that it is as clean as it can be means that we end up with the right answer which is the answer that is the, as, as near to the truth as it can be with what we have available at that time yeah yeah. And I think to just come back to Shigafta's question about 
how can we stop cruelty um, and, and improve animal welfare, I, I would say that both of us probably very strongly believe the way to do that is through evidence. If you can provide evidence to people that animal welfare is suffering because of an action and you can provide, this is very, very important in agriculture, if you can also provide an alternative, if you can say, okay, this method causes a welfare suffering, but here, if you do it this way instead, you will still be able to maintain your productivity and improve animal welfare. I mean, no mm -hmm. farmer sets out, you know, wakes up and, and says, I'm going to go and cause a lot of animal suffering today, legally. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not what these people are, are doing every day. And yeah, but I think that you know, I think the power of the people is important. Yes, um, usually. You know, there was a there's a question on the discussion forums. I haven't read it all properly because it just came in earlier about um, California and and the egg industry. And, the egg, though, yeah. and and I think you know, just I don't know much about California and eggs, but I do know that we've obviously gone through a major revolution. I would say here, you know, certainly a, a huge change. In people's thinking about how we keep hens for egg production in Europe, and really most of the, um, you know, most of this kind of now changes in legislation um, have come about because it started with people being concerned about how eggs were, you know, produced, how hens were being kept in small cages, the, the behaviours that they were unable to perform. And so that came out as a major campaign and a major issue. And it prompted then governments to put money into research to look at, first of all, what were the issues for hens? Because hens are different from people. We don't actually perch. Hens like to perch. If we just went on what we liked, mm -hmm. we'd never have found out how important perching is. Um, so, you know, what's the important things and that they're lacking and what happens to them if you're not allowing them to do something they're very motivated to do how stressed do they get because that was very convincing evidence it meant that people were then you know within within the government and the egg industry people were more persuaded that there there was really a problem and then the second phase was okay you know you may or may not agree with farming but people do eat meat and they do consume a lot of eggs and so if that is to take place, if people are going to do that, and we are going to keep animals in order to produce that sort of um, animal product, then um, what sort of alternatives were there? What are the alternative housing um, hmm. situations that might meet the demand, but also allow the hens to do things that come more naturally to them? And that's where we've got these modified um, environments from. Um, so, you know, that's, I think, kind of demonstrates that you know, answering um, Shugufta's question in a very long-winded way, that um, you, you need both, is my opinion. I think you need people to care enough to protest, and you need the scientists to provide the strongest evidence that they can of what the problems are and what the alternatives might be. And then, as your point was, it comes down to, I'm afraid, compromise, because then you're going to get different ethical perspectives that come into play, different economic arguments that come into play. And sometimes what is actually best for animals is watered down quite a bit yes. by the need to keep these systems productive and so on. And, you know, that's you can say that's wrong, um, but at the end of the day, that is the way it is at the moment. Yeah. I think it's a really interesting question here from... Uh, Timothy James Bolton, I just want to select this one because it reminds me of something which has been in our UK news quite recently, which was, so Timothy asks, would you agree that ethics committees and welfare organisations are often swayed by public opinion and not objective information? And my answer to that would be, yes, I think they are very frequently swayed by opinion where there is no evidence to back it up. And I think an interesting case where this has possibly gone the opposite way, where I was a little bit surprised uh, that our House of uh, Parliament actually passed uh, um, what we call three parent babies, but it's essentially mitochondrial DNA transplants for um, for human uh, for human babies. And our uh, members of Parliament recently passed this bill by quite a large margin, and I was very surprised because there was quite a strong public feeling against it. And usually, any any kind of committee they don't want to be thought bad of, and if public opinion is very strong in one in one direction it's i would say it's the rare committee that goes in the other direction yeah but you know again it comes down to all this compromise stuff so you know the 
the, the, the world's, you know, animals are one part of the, the picture and their welfare. For those of us who are interested in animal welfare and, and people who are part of this MOOC, of which I think there's about 18 or so thousand people signed in for this one, um, you know, I, I suppose we would like to see the animals' argument, um, the animals' position higher up on the agenda. Um, but, you know, in, in many of these situations where these um, different committees and welfare organisations are coming up with their, their different views, um, they're going to be swayed very much by the particular agenda of the group that they represent. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, we work in animal, I, we work in what I call real world animal welfare. And that is where you're actually trying to improve the welfare of the millions of animals that live in developing countries alongside people who are not, you know, not living particularly high quality lives themselves. And in that situation, you know, you're working with many, many different animal welfare organisations and many human welfare organisations. And so it's very difficult to construct an argument that is just about dogs or just about, um, you know, looking after um, chickens better, when in fact you've also got to consider how that's going to have a knock-on effect for the people who are living alongside those animals. And so what we try to look at is win-win situations, which is where you have both animals and yeah. humans in, in the picture together. So of course, you know, you're going to have to make it clear, um, you know, what you're looking at, what you're studying and, and what your agenda might be in terms of the questions that you're asking. But you also have to, you know, once you've produced the work, you have to recognise that it has to be viewed in the bigger picture in that real world. Yeah. And there's a, quite a sort of a relatively recent uh, initiative called the World One World One Health Initiative, which is trying to look at uh, at the whole world as an ecosystem and how can we improve the health and welfare of everything within that world. And there's quite a few, um, well, certainly the university and SRUC are involved in quite a few projects mm -hmm. on the One World One Health Initiative. Yeah. So a sort of more holistic viewpoint works, I think. Um, we have a question here from Indira, which is, uh, when it comes to animals in laboratories for any kind of research, how do you see that in terms of pain management? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's it's an interesting one, the whole um, area of pain management. Um, so, so for those of you um, who don't know this, I'm sure some of you will be very familiar with this, but for any kind of research, um, we expect now that when decisions are being made about whether animals should be used for research purposes, um, there has to be very long um, uh, process of justifying that research in relation to the costs of that research to those animals um, and balancing that with the benefits to humans or to other animals. And part of that process is also now looking at very uh, looking very strongly uh, at replacements. So you know that we don't have replacements for all animals for all. Um, for, for, for all studies, unfortunately, but there's much greater emphasis being put on looking at replacements. So where animals won't be used and when some inanimate sort of um, object, whether that's better statistics or, or yeah. yeah, or better so models and mannequins or um, computer models um, or, you know, cells or something that um, can be shown that it doesn't suffer. Um, so in that situation, obviously replacement's important, but there's also two others. So where you haven't got a replacement, you're expected anyway to reduce the numbers of animals that you use. And um, you've got to show how you've done that. And you also are expected to refine your, your studies, your techniques. And part of refinement is pain management. So they are come around to pain management. It's not only things to do with environmental enrichment, where the animals' environments have got to be better and um, they're not just kept in horrible barren cages, um, but uh, but where we, we handle them better and where we observe them better and where we manage their pain better. And there's some very neat research now that's being done specifically looking at how can you read pain in research animals. And um, so I'm not sure whether we cover it a little bit next week. We do a little bit next week and we will also have a little bit on it in week six as well. Yeah. So in that situation, um, you know, there's some nice work that's looked at facial expression in um, small rodents, um, so mice and rats, 
And there's also some work on rabbits, and that's extended actually now to um, horses as well, yep. although horses tend to not be used in laboratory type studies. So yeah, so there's if we're looking at pain management, the first the first thing about pain management is you've got to recognize that the animal's in pain. And um, now we are much, much better at doing that. The training for the technicians and the scientists is better. And so, um, you know, and then the rules um, are stronger. So nowadays, again, instead of saying that the animals actually have to be in pain in order to look at how well a particular drug or whatever it is has worked, nowadays we'll say, well, actually pain has no place in research because if those animals are going to be good models, they need to be enjoying the highest welfare because good welfare is good science. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you for that question, Indira. Hopefully you'll learn more about it in the uh, coming weeks. So have we got any others from the forums that we were desperately yes. hoping to answer? All right, hang on a minute. I'm just going to... Um... We have our, our second screen over here. Okay, oh, so yeah. Judith's question. So Judith Horvath yes. has asked, um, she's quite interested in how you can become involved in animal welfare studies. So I thought that might be something that we could give a little personal view on. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, uh, if I just start with just a bit of general stuff before I ask Jill about how she became involved, I think the first thing to say is that um, animal welfare, as you've gathered from this week, is is a, is very broad, and people come at it from lots of different angles. It's it is very much a multidisciplinary subject, and so we've got people who are interested in philosophy, moral philosophy. Um, we've got people who are interested in the legislation, animal welfare legislation. Um, there's people who are interested in the economics of good welfare, um, and then you've got the scientists, and you know, and so on. So it's broad. So to become involved in animal welfare um, studies or animal welfare, the whole animal welfare area, means that you will probably come at it from whichever thing that interests you. And all of those people who are commenting and being part of the discussion forums, you know, the veterinarians, the ethicists and so on, you know, are already people who are in, involved in animal welfare because they're, they're talking about it. And I think through talking about things, we drive the whole thing forward get more people talking even if we don't all agree with each other at least we're talking about animal welfare so that's my first big thing and I think the second thing is when we talk about animal welfare research um, or becoming an animal welfare scientist that's obviously one branch of animal welfare and it's the one that we are promoting more through this MOOC um, where we are busily discovering um, knowledge about discovering information about animals and what they do and what matters to them so that we can improve their lot when they are living um, with humans are being used utilized by humans um, for various different purposes and for that i'm going to ask jill to talk a little bit about how she became involved in animal welfare research uh, i actually became involved in animal welfare research through a slightly roundabout kind of fashion i initially um i always loved animals always really loved working with them and i sort of wanted to be a vet for a little while I thought I didn't want to just have one career and I also really loved science so and uh, possibly uh, inaccurately I didn't perceive at the time that uh, veterinary medicine was very scientific so uh, I think it's changed a little bit since when I did uh, my degree but uh, I then decided to go and do zoology at the University of Glasgow because I wanted to do something animal related and I wanted to do science and I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, it was a great degree, hugely enjoyable. I did a what we call an MSI, where I essentially have uh, I did my undergraduate was five years, and I had two research projects in it. And it was I often say the university saw me coming, um, and and knew that they could uh, sell me this um, because it was it was only offered to uh, certain students. It's quite an unusual degree, um, and it's it's very much because I was very passionate about science. And I did a lot of behavioural ecology, a lot of um, sort of very, very typical behavioural ecology style modules, um, lots of conservation biology, uh, lots of sort of sexual ecology of animals, that sort of thing. And animal welfare was really not a huge component of that course at all. Mm. Um, it, it was mentioned as part of science and ethics, but I think there could have been more 
in the course. I would have liked more in the course. Um, but I don't think I really saw myself as an animal welfare scientist. And then I came to, um, to SRC in the University of Edinburgh and I did a PhD where I was asked to investigate a biotelemetry system and cattle personality and evaluate this in terms of what it could tell us about cattle welfare. So because my PhD was looking at cattle welfare, I had a really steep learning curve to suddenly learn all these things about welfare and uh, the sort of what I could bring to that discussion was the behavioural ecology side of things and a sort of an evolutionary history perspective and also my uh, understanding of biotelemetry systems and things like that. And from the welfare perspective, I actually found that very, very fascinating and very challenging. And I loved the, the interplay of ethics and knowledge within animal welfare science. And I got very, very passionate about it. And so after I finished, I considered myself an animal welfare and animal behaviour scientist and uh, haven't really stepped back. I do know, is it, was it Donald Brim that says we need a name for animal welfare scientists? So I can't remember who it is, but so if you're an animal behaviour scientist or an applied animal behaviour scientist, you're called an ethologist. Um, and, but we don't have a name for animal welfare scientists mm. as of yet. No, animal welfare scientists. Animal welfare first. scientists is kind of just the name, but we don't have an ology. Yeah. Um, so for those, there's, so there's, there are different routes. That's one route. I mean, I came through many, many years ago um, through a zoology followed by an animal welfare PhD, and um, and then that, that sort of seems to qualify an awful lot of people for doing welfare studies. But there is other ways now. Um, we have specialist masters programs. I actually do have a bit of an issue with. There are some um, science degrees that you can do that are specifically animal welfare science. I feel very strongly that it's important to get a good grounding as a scientist if that's what you want to go into. And zoology or animal science, they're kind of broad subjects and you get, you know, you get a whole lot of other things too. And then, you know, go on and do some uh, masters, um, which can be, allow it allows you to specialise a bit more so you can do we have a behaviour and welfare masters either online or um, on campus here and there are various other ones around the world and so you can enrol in one of those and they can take anything from one year to six years if you're going to do it part-time and it's intermittently and then once you've got your master's program under your belt that gives you an awful lot more information specifically about measuring yeah. and so on and then you can go on if you want to do a PhD you can do a PhD which can take about three years three and a half years and um, if you're doing it full time and then you end up probably super qualified to be an animal welfare scientist and most of the people now who are working in animal welfare science have invested that much energy in their education to get to the point that they are in which hopefully means that the kind of work that they do and and the information that they put forward is credible and uh, you know and and and, and sound mm. what they often aren't that skilled at is putting that science putting that research that they have into um you know back out into the public sort of forum and a lot of the research councils now if they're giving money for research require that the scientists and the, and the research group demonstrate very clearly how they're going to make that information from their studies accessible to people so that real people can actually, you know, understand the results and the significance of those results, um, and you know, and maybe even put them into practice. So that it's, it's you know, that the science is is actually applied rather than just sitting on the shelf somewhere on, in, in some dusty journal. Yeah, and um, not to blow our own horn, but the University of Edinburgh and SRUC were just ranked as doing this very, very well in the agricultural sciences quite recently in uh, the UK Research Excellence Framework. Mm -hmm. And it's partly because of things like this. We also do a lot of practical work where we try and actually uh, provide solutions for animal welfare and for other aspects of agricultural science as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Something else I would like to mention is that animal welfare is a very, very competitive field. There are a lot of people who are very, very interested in animal welfare and will sacrifice a huge amount uh, to to work in the animal welfare field. And um, I mean, we have lots of people volunteering to come and work in with us. And uh, you really have to sort of distinguish yourself if you do want to go 
and work in animal welfare research, you have to show that you are very, very passionate. And but there's a whole array of different yes, things you can do within that. Things, I mean, yeah. you can be you can be a student, you can be the senior researcher, you can be a technician. Um, you know, who's very involved in you know basically all the practical end of making the thing work. Um, you can be somebody who works within an animal welfare organisation as a scientist who then disseminates that information, um, you know, perhaps agenderize slightly because obviously you pick the information that you want um, to make the good arguments that you mm -hmm. need to make. So, you know, there's there's a whole array of different possibilities yeah, within that whole um, science world. And as I said, just to be clear, that's just the science of animal welfare. Yeah, there's a whole lot of other things that go on as well. Um, so yeah, hopefully that's answered your question, Judith, about how anybody can become involved. Um, I will say it's a hugely rewarding career. We love it. And there were a few other questions that were answered. I'm aware of the time um, yeah. here, and I just want to give some of the viewers here the chance to pop any other questions that they might have, just type them in, and we'll try and answer those in the last sort of five or ten minutes. Um, otherwise, you're going to get us rambling on about a few of the other questions <laughs> that we like. That we yeah, the questions that we like, yeah, um, as opposed to the questions that you guys like. Uh, how have you been finding this, uh, the second run of the mix so far? That's quite interesting because, you know, we were, uh, you know, as, as you probably gathered, we had a large number of people who were with us um, in July yeah. and August last year for the first running of it. It was a bit of a learning curve for everybody. So this time round, I think we're a bit more relaxed because we know what it's about. Yeah. So I'm quite enjoying it. And we've been helped um, by a few of our PhD students. Yeah, who very are, thankful for them. Yeah, who are wonderful. And so they're the ones that are answering a lot of the questions on the discussion forums and monitoring things just so that they're picking up on stuff. And um, along with Jill and then some of us um, staff also pop in and out and answer questions that we think that you know we've perhaps um, got a bit more information mm -hmm. about so i'm quite enjoying it i'm fascinated to know though because um, we translated the videos so that there are subtitles in spanish and mandarin and i would love to know from the discussion forums whether those have been useful yeah do let us know please give if us any feedback. of you are watching yeah. now or if you watch later please give us feedback because that was quite a big uh, mission to try and get done, um, but you know, obviously ready for this particular um, showing. And I yeah, just hope they've been useful. Yeah, because the more the... people that you can share this with, the better. So, here we have a question from Megan. So, Megan asks Are there any industries or brands which we are aware of that are so inconsiderate of animal that the ethical thing to do would be to boycott? In other words, industries or brands that have been unwilling to negotiate for better conditions. Mm, now, Megan, I think this is, again, it kind of harps back to what we were saying about um, as scientists, we try and look at things objectively. So I can't necessarily, I certainly, I wouldn't want to tell you of anything about my own personal um, purchasing. So I have rules about how I purchase things and I'm not comfortable in T in, in in giving you that opinion I think you probably find out a lot of information about you know um, things that particularly certain societies are concerned about and they've done their own research I mean yeah you'd have to do a little bit of research yourself to, to look at what the particular welfare issues are at the moment off the top of my head I can't think of anything and um, that you know that comes to mind very no, quickly I can't but think of I, you know there are I mean there is a huge issue um, in fact, this ties in a little bit with the next question from Kieran. Um, there was a huge issue with the live transport of um, sheep from Australia to the um, Arabian countries. Mm. And um, you know, some of the pictures, I mean, I wasn't there, I didn't see it, but I did have um, colleagues in Australia who were very, very concerned about the conditions of those animals as they were loaded on, um, transported, and then how they were handled at the other end. Um, there was a fair bit of investment that was put in uh, from the Australian end to make sure that the conditions on board those ships were very good. Um, but, you know, of course, there was no legislating for what actually happened at the other end. So once those animals were the property of, of another country who where animal welfare was less of a priority and where there was less, there was just no legislation, really, then there were issues about how those animals were being handled 
and transported and then indeed killed that might well have caused quite a few people to, um, in fact, it did cause quite a lot of people to protest about yeah. that. So there are, I mean, you know, I mean, I, you know, I think that it's important that we recognise that we, ha if you're going to take an ethical point of view, in, in my opinion, I think it's important to do your research so that you know the facts about what those issues are, what you're actually, what you are objecting to, um, so that you know you, if you want to influence other people, that you can be very clear about yeah. what it is that you feel is the problem and what evidence you have for that, because um, it makes it a stronger argument. Yeah, really. and I think you know what we don't want to do in this course is impart our ethical opinions onto you. We would like to give and you we the, have them. We for sure. Oh. <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> we absolutely, have them, for sure, yeah. About lots but, of different things. You know, we want to. Um, we want to give you the evidence and the skills to go and look for evidence so that you can come up with your own decisions. Yeah. Um, so, and then I guess that kind of um, <clears throat> ties in with um, Suresh. Suresh. Um, so you ask about whether testing um, human usable products and animals really gives the right result. In other words, how, you know, how, how mm. sure are we that these um, products are actually going to be safe after they've been tested on animals and I think that's I mean I it, that's a huge field and I can't answer it all at the moment but I think it's an important thing to make sure that again um, any new product to the market is um, you know if you're going to use it that you know how it's been tested yeah. it's interesting that um, a lot of tests for products that have already been tested if you like have been removed now um, so you know, there's always there was the kind of concern that if they're not being as tested as well as they used to be tested, how safe are they going to be yeah. for humans? So again, it comes down to, you know, that whole kind of, um, you know, should we be using animals to to test products on them that are going to be used by humans? And if we are, what which products are we comfortable testing? If you know, if yeah. we are going to use animals, and then, well, what level of testing do you want to do in order to make sure that those products are safe? And I think it actually loops back to what Nat was saying as well about good science is also about good animal welfare. Um, if you don't have, uh, if we use an animal model, but it's a stressed animal model because it doesn't have uh, appropriate enrichment in its environment or, um, you know, it's it's stressed unnecessarily, then your science is not going to be as good. So it's very important that we consider animal welfare in that and be very critical of these uh, of these studies, constructively critical, I would say. So, Kieran asks, yes, oh, we've asked, answered that one, sorry. A little bit, sorry, we're flying along now. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, this is from Maria. Um, yeah, Venezuela, um, sounds like a lovely, amazing country, although I did read your posts of concern about dogs and cats and people perhaps not caring so much about them. And um, so um, hopefully, this will be interesting to you and um, hopefully you can get more of your colleagues to mm. sign up for it. So thank you for your comments. And what else have we got here from Andre? So Andre asks, not sure if we're going to talk about this in the coming weeks, but Andre would like to hear a little bit more about international declarations on animal rights. And in particular, any update on the Universal Declaration of Animal mm. Welfare? Yeah, well, you know what? We're not really going to be talking about declarations. We don't on talk human a lot rights. about policy and law, no, do we? Um, but certainly, if you want an update on the Universal Declaration on Animal Welfare, I suggest very strongly that you go to the Animal Mosaic. We'll send you the link, mm. which is the World Animal Protection's website. Um, where you can pick up on an awful lot of the uh, the different sort of things that they're doing in relation to animal welfare. And I mean, the Universal Declaration on Animal Welfare, I think, was very much championed by what was WSPA, which is now World Animal Protection. So, yeah, we'll give you the link and you can have a look at that yourself. Yeah. Um, but yes, interesting. Uh, I do know that last year people were asking us if we would add a Law and Policy Week on. Mm. There's so much that we could cover in these MOOCs, on and on, you know, if we yeah. had... If we could, so if like we could a do a 52 week course. MOOC, we would, yeah. but we can't. But we have jobs. <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. we have jobs and we have to make a living to feed all these animals that we've got. Yeah. Well, it's actually my day off today. Is it? Yes. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed, but in my email it says I'm off. All right. uh, I came in for you guys because you're oh. just that lovely. But look, we're now three o'clock and so we've had an hour with you. Um, we're going to have to 
stop now and thank you very much for spending time with us on this Google Hangout. I'm heading off to India um, on Saturday and I'll be back on Wednesday evening. And during that time, Jill and the PhD students will be answering lots of questions. I'll, if I can, I will try and post something from India um, where we're, uh, colleagues of uh, will be working in Delhi will be actually presenting work um, to the Indian um, animal welfare, well, the uh, Indian researchers to try to get them more interested in animal welfare. Um, so hopefully that will be a very positive response mm. if we do our job well. And so, yes, yeah, so I'll try and post something from there. But if not, we'll see you again um, at the Google Hangout on Friday next week, yeah. if you'd like to join us again. And next week um, will be all about looking at how we assess animal welfare, some of the measures that are made, the behavioural measure, measures, the physiological measures. So please stick with it. But thank you very much indeed. And have a good week. Yes, thank you very much, guys. Enjoy the weekend and the rest of the course. Bye. Bye-bye.